The history of a company is often marked by turning points, moments where a major challenge opens the door for innovation. For Ducati, that moment came in the form of the Panta 500. However, to understand the significance of the Panta, we first need to look at the product that preceded it, the Ducati 500 GTL, a motorcycle that negatively impacted the company's reputation and became the catalyst for a change in direction. In the early 1970s, with Japanese manufacturers dominating the market, Ducati's management made a strategic decision that proved to be a misstep. They believed the future of mid-sized motorcycles lay with parallel twin engines, a popular configuration among their Japanese competitors. This decision overlooked Ducati's own lack of success with this engine type, and more importantly, ignored the racing DNA that had defined the brand. The result was the Ducati 500 GTL, a motorcycle that was the antithesis of the company's core values. Technically, the 500 GTL was a troubled product. Its 500cc engine produced only about 35 to 36 horsepower, an underwhelming figure for a motorcycle with a dry weight of over 397 pounds. Its performance was limited and fell far short of the expectations of Ducati fans. For comparison, the Honda CB 504 from the same period produced 48 horsepower with a similar weight, giving it a clear performance advantage. The GTL's engine was also known for being unreliable, with a reputation for frequent crankcase failures. Its 180-degree piston configuration caused strong vibrations at low RPMs, making it uncomfortable for city riding. From a design perspective, the bike was also unsuccessful. Styled by car designer Giorgetto Giugiaro, the 500 GTL's appearance was described as boring and lacked the sporty character that was a hallmark of Ducati. Its single down tube frame was considered merely adequate and didn't inspire confidence in corners. Sales reflected these shortcomings. Only about 7,000 units were produced over its eight-year production run, a small number in the motorcycle market. This failure was more than just a product issue. It was a period of uncertainty for the company's direction. In an attempt to emulate the commercial success of Japanese commuter bikes, Ducati had strayed from its essence. The result was a product that had neither the reliability of a Japanese motorcycle nor the performance of a Ducati. Furthermore, the 500 GTL's failure cannot be separated from its corporate context. During this period, Ducati was under the control of the Italian state, first through EFIM and then VM Motori. State-controlled management was often bureaucratic, risk-averse, and made decisions based on market analysis rather than engineering vision. They saw the commercial success of Japanese parallel twin engines and chose to imitate them as the safe path. This decision shows that the 500 GTL's failure was not just a technical mistake, but also a symptom of a corporate culture that stifled innovation. Amid the uncertainty that plagued Ducati in the mid-1970s, one figure played a crucial role, Dr. Fabio Taglioni. His vision for engineering and racing performance became the guide that would lead Ducati out of a difficult period. The development of the Panta was the implementation of Taglioni's philosophy, a project that not only created a new motorcycle, but also redefined the company's future. Fabio Taglioni, who served as Ducati's technical director from 1954 to 1989, was the creative force behind the company's technical identity. His legacy is embodied in three pillars that define modern Ducati, the desmodromic valve system, the 90-degree L-twin engine, and the trellis frame. While management pushed the company toward commercial products like the 500 GTL, Taglioni remained committed to Ducati's technical vision. The development of the Panta was a collaborative effort. One of the key figures in this process was Gianluigi Gigi Mengoli, a young engineer who worked under Taglioni's guidance. Mengoli played an important role in turning Taglioni's concepts into reliable mechanical realities. 
The strategic turning point in the Pantas conception was the decision to return to Ducati's racing DNA. Instead of looking to competitors' products for inspiration, Talioni looked to the racetrack. Specifically, the blueprint for the Panta came from Ducati's 500cc Grand Prix race prototype from 1973. This decision ensured that the new motorcycle would be designed from the ground up with performance as its main priority. The most tangible evidence of this connection is the adoption of the same engine dimensions. The Panta 500 SL used a bore and stroke of 74 mm by 58 mm, identical to that of the GP500 race bike. By basing a production motorcycle on a race prototype, Ducati sent a clear message. They were back to focusing on performance. The most prominent innovation on the Panta was the replacement of the complex bevel gear valve drive system with toothed rubber timing belts. Before the Panta, Ducati's Desmodromic engines used a series of shafts and bevel gears to drive the camshafts. Although precise, this system was very expensive to produce, required assembly by skilled technicians, and was noisy and heavy. <laughs> The switch to a belt drive was a highly effective solution. Toothed rubber belts were much cheaper to produce, lighter, quieter, and simplified both the assembly and maintenance of the engine. This was the key that allowed Ducati to mass produce the Desmodromic L-Twin engine economically without sacrificing its main advantage, precise valve control at high RPMs. The Panta was the first Ducati to use this technology. Additionally, Talioni revised the cylinder head design, implementing a narrower 60-degree included valve angle. This design improved gas flow, which directly increased efficiency and produced more power. Another innovation was the crankcase design, where the swing arm pivoted directly on the rear of it, reducing the effect of chain snatch during acceleration and creating a more rigid and compact drive unit. The second fundamental innovation introduced by the Panta was the tubular steel trellis frame. Before the Panta, Ducati used a cradle-type frame. For the Panta, Talioni and his team designed a frame consisting of straight steel tubes welded together to form a rigid yet lightweight lattice structure. The key concept behind this design was the use of the engine as a stressed member of the frame. The Panta's trellis frame served as a link between the steering head at the front and mounting points on the engine. By eliminating the lower tubes, this design significantly reduced the total weight of the motorcycle while increasing rigidity. The result was a more agile and easier to handle bike that provided better feedback to the rider. This trellis frame was so successful that it became a visual and technical hallmark of Ducati for decades. The design's advantage also lay in its balance of rigidity and flexibility. While very rigid against braking and acceleration forces, the frame had a degree of controlled lateral side-to-side -side flex. This flexibility allowed the frame to give slightly when the bike was leaned over, providing valuable feedback to the rider about the front tire's grip level. This feel allowed riders to push the bike to its limits with more confidence. The Ducati Panta 500 SL was officially introduced at the Milan Bike Show in December 1979, with the first production units going on sale in 1980. The motorcycle immediately drew attention for its new design and promise of performance. Reviews from the automotive media at the time were very positive, especially praising the bike's good handling characteristics. An important recognition for the Panta's design came quickly. In 1979, the leading Italian motorcycle magazine, Motociclismo, named the Ducati Panta the best 500cc sport bike of its time. For a company struggling to rebuild consumer confidence, this award was invaluable. It confirmed that Ducati's innovations, the belt drive and trellis frame, were a calculated development that had resulted in a motorcycle with class-leading performance and handling. More than just a product success, the Panta became a symbol of fundamental change within Ducati itself. Many acknowledged that the Panta 500 marked 
the end of state administration, and the beginning of a new era for Ducati. For years under state control, Ducati had suffered from a lack of vision and inadequate investment. Sales had dropped from 7,000 motorcycles in 1981 to less than 2,000 in 1984. In this context, the Panta became the company's most valuable asset. Its modern and cost-effective engine platform was a technological asset. This did not go unnoticed by Kajiva, an Italian motorcycle company looking to expand. In the early 1980s, before purchasing Ducati, Kajiva signed an agreement to buy a supply of Panta engines for use in their own models, such as the Kajiva Alazura and Elephant. This business relationship highlighted the strategic value of the Panta platform. Without this modern engine architecture, the financially struggling Ducati might not have been an attractive acquisition target. When the Castiglione brothers of Kajiva finally bought Ducati from VM Motori in 1985, they weren't just buying a historic name, they were buying a solid technological foundation in the form of the Panta architecture. Thus, the Panta not only improved Ducati's reputation, but also helped to improve its financial condition. Ducati's philosophy has often been linked to racing. The ultimate validation for any Ducati engineering innovation had to come from the racetrack. The Panta was developed into the 600 TT2 race bike, and its competitive success in the Formula TT World Championship not only proved the superiority of its design, but also kept Ducati's racing image alive during a difficult financial period. The TT2 was an optimized version of the light and powerful design philosophy pioneered by the Panta. Its engine was based on the Panta unit, with its capacity increased to 597 cubic centimeters. With race tuning, the engine was capable of producing 78 horsepower at 10,500 revolutions per minute. Its main advantage, however, lay in its chassis. The TT2 was the first Ducati race bike to use a trellis frame made by Verlicky which weighed only 15 pounds. Combined with other lightweight components, the total dry weight of the TT2 was just about 309 pounds. This balance of power and lightweight created a very agile race bike. In the hands of the right rider, the Ducati 600 TT2 became a highly competitive motorcycle. British rider Tony Rudder formed a successful partnership with the TT2. From 1981 to 1984, Rudder and his TT2 were successful in the Formula 2 class, winning four consecutive world championships. These victories were achieved on challenging circuits, including the Isle of Man TT. The success of the TT2 was not limited to the world stage. In Italy, the bike was also dominant, winning the national championship in 1981 and 1982. This success was important because it proved that Ducati's V-twin configuration could compete with and beat the four-cylinder motorcycles from Japanese manufacturers. Additionally, these victories came at a time when Ducati was in a difficult financial situation. The success of the TT2 on the racetrack served as a source of optimism and kept Ducati's high-performance image alive in the eyes of fans. The most direct legacy of the Panta is its role as the predecessor to Ducati's superbike lineup. When a new generation of engineers, led by Massimo Bordi and Gianluigi Mengoli, was tasked with developing Ducati's first four-valve engine, they built upon the foundation laid by the Panta. The Ducati 851 engine, launched in 1987, was explicitly based on the 1978 Panta bottom end. The Panta's strong and compact crankcase architecture proved robust enough to serve as the basis for the development of the four-valve, liquid-cooled, and fuel-injected Desmoquatro engine. This was the engine that would bring Ducati its first World Superbike Championship victory in 1990. This lineage continued to the Ducati 916. The development of the 916 family can be traced back through the 851 and 888 series to the early Panta model. Nearly every modern Ducati L-twin up to the Panigal era is a descendant of the architecture pioneered by the Panta. Without the reliable and cost-effective Panta platform, the technological leap to the 851 and then to the 916 
would not have been possible. Oh, go on the Bobby. brakes. Well, no, he went round the outside him at the top there. of the hill, then outbraked him going down the hill. That was absolutely outstanding from Carl Fogarty there. Really. He was